uh, if there's whatever is actually bound here. We're live. You're good to go, Rachel. All right. I see that the number of particip participants is climbing oh, I up see. and up. Yes. Um, so... exponentially there, I guess. <laughs> yes. Um, I will just give it another 30 seconds or so to let everyone get in, and then we'll get started. It looks like the number is slowing down. Um, so we'll begin the webinar. Um, first of all, good evening, everybody. Um, we are so glad to have you here today um, and appreciate you taking the time out of um, what we know are very busy schedules um, to join us for this talk. Um, given by Dr. Stephen Kurtz, um, medication as a part of an SM treatment plan who, what, when, why, how, and how long. Um, I saw a question pop up already asking about whether this presentation will be recorded. Um, and in fact, yes, it will be. So the um, registration will be, or I'm sorry, the presentation will be recorded and um, uploaded to the Selective Mutism Association's um, YouTube channel within the next day or two. And everyone who registered tonight will be emailed with a link um, to the video. You'll also receive not just the slides that you see Dr. Kurtz present today, but um, some slides with some bonus material um, for you to review in them. As we go through the presentation, um, we encourage you to ask questions using either the Q&A um, Q box or the chat feature of Zoom, um, you know, both of which are usually found kind of down at the bottom middle of your screen. And there is an option to click send anonymously if you would like to um, remain anonymous when asking your question. Um, as we go through the talk, I may answer some questions um, via chat, but we'll save a solid 15 minutes at the end for Dr. Kurtz to field as many questions as he can. Um, we're expecting a pretty large group tonight, so we may not be able to get through every question today. Um, but Dr. Kurtz has graciously offered um, his time for a second kind of question and answer webinar. So we will have an opportunity to talk further about anything that we can't cover. Um, so as far as other housekeeping notes, um, we wanted to let you know that um, many of you may be interested in our next webinar, um, which will take place on June 16th at um, the same time, 7 p.m. Eastern. And that is entitled Parents Helping Kids with SM. What's too much? What's not enough? Um, and you can um, register for that through the link that I think will end up in the chat or through our website. Um, so to introduce our distinguished speaker tonight, um, Stephen Kurtz, PhD, ABPP, is the president of Kurtz Psychology Consulting, a New York City-based mental health group serving the emotional and behavioral needs of young children. He specializes in assessing and treating externalizing behaviors such as ADHD and oppositionality, as well as severe anxiety behaviors such as selective mutism and social phobia. He is a global trainer in parent-child interaction therapy, or PCIT, and a dedicated advocate for children with special needs. His team has done pioneering work in teacher-child interaction therapy, or TCIT, bringing behavioral coaching to, for teachers to a new level of effectiveness. Dr. Kurtz is the developer of parent-child interaction therapy adapted for selective mutism and empirically supported therapy for SM. He also created the renowned Mighty Mouth and Brave Bunch SM intensive treatment programs. 
an expert commentator. He has appeared on numerous programs addressing child mental health, including NBC's Today Show, CBS's The Early Show, and PBS's Keeping Kids Healthy. And he was featured in the Canadian broadcasting companies ADD and Loving It. He is a board certified diplomat in behavioral and cognitive psychology from the American Board of Professional Psychology and volunteers time in the leadership of numerous organizations, including the Selective Mutism Organization Association. Um, so with that, I will welcome Steve. Um, but before I turn it over to him, I also want to make sure that you know that tonight's webinar um, is brought to you by the SMA and was made possible thanks to a very generous grant from the Gordon and Marilyn Macklin Foundation, um, which has been a, a great supporter of our work. So Steve, over to you. Thank you for that great introduction. I really appreciate it. You're uh, welcome. So we always uh, need to disclose if we have any financial conflicts of interest. I don't, but I have other conflicts of interest that I want to talk to you about. One is that I am incredibly invested in developing robust behavioral treatments. I'm a psychologist. I'm not a prescriber. I can't prescribe medicine, and I have no relationship whatsoever to any drug companies in any way, shape, or form. And I'm incredibly invested in getting kids better, and not just a little better, but really, really better to the point that they are like they are in your home when they're out in public. And many of the kids that we all have worked with have overcome SM to the point that they look back on it and barely remember it. Some actually don't remember it. And some grow up and to become counselors and junior counselors in our, in our programs. So kids with SM, when they present, are really impaired. These are easy to understand graphs. I'm just gonna explain them for you. Um, the red lines are the ratings that parents provide about how talkative kids are who don't have SM. And the blue bars show how much talking kids do in school, home and family, and public social situations. And you can see that the blue bars are very different than the red bars. In fact, zero represents never, one represents seldom, two represents often, and three represents always. So on average, the kids that we meet at diagnosis are sort of never talking in school. They're not talking at home, even though they're relatively more talkative at home than they are at school. They're still not as talkative as peers who don't have SM. And in public and social situations, they're also drastically uh, not communicating uh, verbally. And these levels of impairment really are staggering and, and they really they really are, are uh, uh, one way to reflect just how serious this is. And what's it like to have SM? One person said to me, imagine if when you got up in front of people to talk, you were completely naked. It is a daunting experience. Now it's important to know that the typical kid we see has not only SM, but more than one anxiety diagnosis. In fact, the most common second diagnosis is having social anxiety disorder, which is distinct from selective mutism. But in general, the kids we meet have at least two diagnoses, if not more, which means that they're up against a lot. So what do we know about treating child anxiety disorders? We actually know quite a bit. The largest and longest anxiety trial ever done was called CAMS, stood for Child and adolescent anxiety. Uh, and in this study, about 500 kids from age seven to 17 were randomized. The families agreed to have them randomized either to get expert cognitive behavior therapy, what we call CBT, or expert medication with board certified child and adolescent psychiatrists, or to get the combination treatment. And another arm of the treatment or another group agreed to possibly get placebo medication. So what was observed was that 55% of kids who got CBT alone had excellent responses by 16 weeks, that 60% of kids who got medication alone did significantly well by 16 weeks, but 81% of the kids who got the combination therapy did significantly well by 16 weeks. So you're a parent. 
is 55% odds 16 weeks into treatment. Is that good enough for you? It may well be because you might say, I'll take my chances on that. If I'm in the group that did great by 16 weeks, we're good. If I'm in the group that didn't do well by then, maybe I can add medicine to the treatment plan. But there is a big difference between 55% significant positive outcome versus 81% significant positive outcome. Now, the question I asked a minute ago is what do we know about treating child anxiety? Because in that study, they treated kids with all kinds of anxiety disorders. They treated social anxiety disorder, separation anxiety disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and a few kids who had SM because it's not that common a disorder. But now I want to ask the question, what do we know about treating selective mutism? Well, I'm going to tell you, we know a lot more than we did 10 years ago. And in that time, 2013 was when the first published randomized controlled trial came out about a behavioral therapy for SM. It was done by Lindsay Bergman and colleagues at UCLA, showed good results, some of which held up over time, but not, uh, not as well as kids immediately post-treatment. Not everybody got better. And then in the same year, and these pu publications came out right before our conference in 2013, a Norwegian study came out and they characterized their treatment as defocused communication, which was very similar to the kinds of behavior therapy that we currently do. And they showed good results, and, uh, but not everybody got better and results held up pretty well over time, but some kids did fall off. And then in 2019, Colleagues of mine out at the University of British Columbia, uh, led by Roz Catchpole, did a trial of the treatment that I happen to have developed, PCIT for selective mutism, and did it with individual families and showed really nice results at the end of the trial. And then in the same year, Daniel Carnaccio and uh, colleagues at Florida International University published on the group version of the treatment that I had developed. And uh, those results uh, were published in the most prestigious of our psychology journals. So what do we know taking all these studies into account? We know that most kids will benefit from treatment and that's a good thing. We know that treatment response varies tremendously from kids who don't get better to kids who get better a little bit to kids who get moderately better to kids who knock it out of the park. So we know some kids will get really, really, really better. Some kids will not get really, really better despite the fact that they got the same good treatment from the same good providers being done by the same parents who actually did the exposures. And yet two kids who come in at the same time with the same good treatment and the parents will work in the program just as hard and one kid gets better and one kid doesn't or one kid gets really better and the other kid it kind of struggles along after months and months. And we're not good at knowing at the start of treatment, which kids will be the responders and which kids won't be the responders to any of the behavioral treatments, whether it's the treatment that I happen to have developed or any of the other treatments uh, that are out there. So it boils down to just how hard is it for your child to get through the day and to work through treatment? Working the treatment program can be really, really hard. It is not for the faint of heart. We do build a relationship with kids and then ask them to take huge risks that feel to them really, really, really hard. Um, I don't like the phrase, uh, we push the kids. I had a mom describe to me yesterday whose kid is responding really well to the protocol. She said, uh, I know I need to push my kid. And I said to her, the word push, at least in English and American culture, is close to pushy, and pushy we think of as a negative thing. So I don't think of the treatment as pushy, but I do think of it as really hard. We ask kids to really challenge themselves and go into a, a zone of uh, being uncomfortable. And many of you know, uh, I'm kind of associated with the phrase, get comfortable being uncomfortable. And it can still be too hard, even with the right help. Here's this person trying to scale whatever El Capitan this is, or whatever mountain it is, whatever rock face it is, and even with all of that help, it can still be too difficult. 
So you may ask, what is the risk of undertreating? What's the risk of not getting enough treatment? I was doing a IEP meeting today with a school, and they said that the child is responding. The mother and I feel that he's really just could have, sort of crawling along. And they said, but he looks like he likes the treatment. And I said to them, maybe it's a matter of the dose of the treatment. So what are the risks of undertreating? I would argue that every day that a child continues with SM is not neutral. If you have a snake phobia, the chances are that the strength of your phobia yesterday is the same as the strength of your phobia today, and it will be the same sort of level of avoidance tomorrow, because it's unlikely you ran into any snakes today. If you're afraid of the dentist, it's unlikely that you will feel more scared tomorrow than you did today. On the other hand, if you are a kid with selective mutism, every day that you go to school, every day that you go in your community, you are practicing probably 50 to 200 times, depending how you, you measure this. Again, practicing the habit of avoidance and the strength of that habit gets stronger. So I'm a big believer proponent that every day that a kid continues impaired is not neutral, it actually makes the problem worse. It also strengthens the perceptions of others, of the kid in school, of the teacher in school, of other people in your life that, hey, that's the kid who doesn't talk. And I know that if there are 112 of you out there, let's say 100 of you are parents, I know half of you have heard somewhere, mommy, that's the kid who doesn't talk. And it's very, very painful for you. It can be demoralizing to you, it can be demoralizing to your child. And it also decreases this thing that we call self-efficacy, which is different than self-esteem. Self-esteem is how you feel about yourself. Self-efficacy is the extent to which you believe that you can actually do the behavior we're talking about. In the long term, what are the risks of undertreating? And I put an asterisk there to remind me to say to you that these characteristics and outcomes that I have here, they are not meant to scare you. I don't treat by scaring people, but the data are there that kids who have long-term anxiety disorders typically build additional anxiety disorders. They are at greater risk for adding depression to the picture, and they are at risk for some of these unwanted outcomes. Difficulty with absences from school, underachievement, difficulty with peer relations, and sometimes other more serious adult concerns, as you see listed here. This is a graph showing outcomes on a standard rating scale from zero to three, where zero is never talks, seldom talks, often talks, always talks. And at the end of good treatments, we get kids up to about two, which means often talking. Now that's great if you've got the kid who, who actually got that two rating. But understand when you look at a graph of a study like this, that half the kids did better than the two, but it also means that half the kids did worse than the two. So here you are, you've signed up for a treatment, you go to the camp, you do the intensive, and you do the follow-up, and your kid is in the lower group. What do you do? Do you continue and just accept that, or do you do something to boost their treatment? So I wanna share with you when and why I started caring so much about adding medicine to treatment plans by sharing with you um, uh, one of the kids I work with who I'll call Rachel for the purposes of the presentation, that's not her real name. She was six years old, she was in first grade, had a strong family history of anxiety on both sides. So far, a very, very typical kid for us. She spoke to parents quite easily in our clinic, very typical. She spoke when we were in the room as well with ease, very typical. Quickly started talking to me in the clinic, playing games, fantastic, fairly typical. Easily talked to mom and me in her classroom as soon as we went there in the 20, 30 minute period before the kids would arrive. 8.15, the kids start pouring in, voice goes off, literally. Continue talking with these when a teacher was then added to the room in the time before school day officially began and talked fabulously well as long as the teacher didn't come close. We were able to successfully fade the teacher closer and closer. She maintained a higher rate of verbals. But as soon as 
mom faded more than an arm's length away from her, leaving me and the teacher there. Voice went completely off. So we're 23 sessions into treatment before she could talk to the teacher with mom only at the doorway. That's a lot of time. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of days going by that she's still impaired. And so that's when I got more interested, more motivated to, to think what would happen if we added medicine to the mix. I would tell you that unfortunately, I was not able to beseech that family to add medicine. They ended up going to another provider. Uh, a couple of years later with that other provider, they made the difficult decision to uh, add medication to their mix. So when we think about who, and when we would want you to consider adding medicine to the mix, we think about kids who are not really responding to the treatment at the expected rate. Because 23 sessions in, most kids are doing fabulously well and um, not so limited that they, as the case I just described a minute ago. We think about adding medicine for kids who are not moving along at an acceptable rate, an expected rate, at a rate that makes them feel confident, at a rate that makes them feel proud, at a rate that makes them feel some relief, and at a rate that makes them feel like efficacious, which means that they are able to do this thing, that with, when they put their effort into it, that they're successful and they're making gains that are obvious to them. So it caused me to go, when I was with that girl who I'm calling Rachel, it caused me to go back to my team at the time with Dr. Richard Gallagher, the co-founder of the uh, NYU Selective Mutism Program when I was there back in the day. And we started looking at trajectories based on known cases. So we know that by a few sessions in, kids should not be looking angry. They shouldn't be looking like deer in the headlights and they shouldn't be frightened at all to start sessions. We know by a few sessions, progress should actually be obvious even if it's slow and steady. We know by two to three sessions in that most kids are easily talking to us in a room with their parent present. We know by four to six sessions that most kids are talking to the therapist with their, present, with their parent not present in the room. When I was doing a session with a gal in Texas a couple of months ago, and the kid was talking to me in the first session when I debriefed with mom, uh, I said to her, so do you think I'm a magician or these techniques are really good? She said, I think you're a magician. I said, I appreciate that. But these techniques are teachable and they're learnable. And it happens that her kid was a good responder. Next week, I'm doing the same exact routine with another kid with an equally well-functioning parent with an equally charming child, and she was a non-responder to the same intervention. By six to eight sessions in, we expect to be in school and having kids talking to an adult without their parent present in the room. By eight to 12 sessions in, we know that most kids will be talking to multiple teachers and students even if the situations are contrived, meaning kind of a pullout, maybe the kids are going to general library and we hang back in the room where we meet early in the morning before uh, all of the kids are joining their class. And uh, as uh, Kristen and uh, Rachel was saying before, as Rachel was saying before, these slides will be made available to you so you don't have to worry if you didn't catch these benchmarks in addition to other uh, extra material in the slides. So what to do when your child isn't progressing enough? When parents ask us about our philosophy of medicine, when, they, when we bring up the topic, we tell them that we are unlikely to recommend medicine at the start for kids who are very young, for kids who have less severe impairment with their SM, for kids who have fewer related other symptoms, for kids who have not had a trial of behavior therapy in the past, for kids who don't have other disorders, and for kids who are meeting the expected benchmarks, meaning we're doing therapy and we see gains. We do more therapy, we see more gains. So if a kid is young, not so impaired, hasn't had CBT before, and is responding to the therapy, we would never think about adding medicine to the mix. If you're able to ride a two-wheel bicycle, why would I wanna add training wheels? It's, it would be a step backwards. On the other hey, hand, quick question. When, yes. you, uh, when you refer to a young child in this context, what is that age range you're talking about? I'm referring to kids under nine because on their ninth birthday, 
and I'm saying that kiddingly, not seriously, they become older kids and there's data to show that they are significantly more difficult to treat. So that would be the, the range that I'm generally talking about. And I'll say more about that in a minute. On the other hand, if we meet an older child, if we meet a kid whose SM is really impairing, if we meet a kid who has high related symptoms, a kid who's maybe even tried behavior therapy before and not had a good response, a kid who has high comorbidities, which means other diagnoses, like maybe they also have OCD, maybe they also have social anxiety disorder, maybe they also have uh, generalized anxiety disorder. And most importantly, or, or very importantly, a kid who's not meeting the benchmarks. If you're in my practice, we're gonna have a discussion with you and say, listen, you are in this group of folks who may well need medicine in order for your child to benefit from the behavioral treatment. These are not absolutes, and it's not like you tick one box and you're in the medication waiting room, but these are general frameworks for us to think about who we would and wouldn't medicate. I did an information call yesterday with a parent of a 14-year-old whose kid has been in uh, therapy with a board-certified psychologist since they were two years old. That means they've been in therapy for 12 years, and they're still so symptomatic that they're not talking to the homeroom teacher or their friends in school. That's a kid I'm gonna want on medicine before I start to try and do behavior therapy, not because I need them to make my batting average higher, but because I want them to be successful at another treatment. Because if you're a kid and you've been to two or three therapists already, you gotta be thinking, great, they're dragging me to another one. What's this clown gonna do that the others haven't done? And I want to set you up for success and so medicine may be uh, added to the treatment plan. Before you go on, can you say a quick word about how you would define um, less severe versus more severe SM symptoms on the previous slide? When I think about more severe and less severe, I think about things like, are there important adults in your life you're not able to talk to? Are there aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents you're not talking to? You're more severe. Did you get hurt and you were unable to tell the nurse? That's more severe. Did you get left on the bus because you forgot to tell the driver you couldn't get off? That's more severe. Did you have a kid take your toy and not able to say, hey, I was using that? That's more severe. The kids who are less severe are the kids, for example, who if the teacher goes with them to the side of the room and says, sweetie, did you bring your snack today or we need to get you something is able to answer that. If, and so I think about those kind of functional ways of thinking about severity. And we can talk more about that perhaps in the Q and A. So every parent I've ever met, if we start talking about medicine, they say, yeah, but what's the, what's the side effects? What's the long-term effects? And I think it's a really legitimate question. But I beg you, if you're going to ask that question, you also need to beg the same question about the opposite, which is what is the effect of not having strong enough treatment? What's the effect of being chronically impaired with interfering, impairing selective mutism and other anxiety disorders day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year? What does it mean to have the brain bathing in counter-regulatory hormones that are unsettled. So I think that as a good consumer and you are in charge of your child's care, you need to ask and think about all four of these aspects you see in front of you. You need to think, what are the pros of doing behavioral treatment only? What are the cons of doing behavioral treatment only as we're experiencing it? And what are the pros of doing combined treatment and what are the cons of doing combined treatment? No simple answers here, but you know, print this out, put that on the desk in front of the person you're talking to about medication and say, let's talk about all of these. Because if you only think about the potential negative effects of medicine, then I think you're not getting a full enough picture. That's my opinion, my philosophy. Communication is key. If you're a parent in our practice, we talk with you about medicine at the initial assessment. We talk with you about it because we want to set the stage that while we hope our behavioral therapy will be adequate enough to give you a great outcome, we don't want you to be surprised when we sit with you and say, it seems like we're 
not exactly where we want to be. Let's have the discussion about medicine that we talked about originally. You don't want to wait until a poor outcome before you start having that discussion. I think being an educated consumer is really important. I debated keeping the next part of the slide in because I work at kurtzpsychology.com. We're not a .edu and we're not a .org, but I think we're reputable. But in general, people feel like they have more confidence in edu websites and .org websites. That's not an exclusive rule, but it's just something to be aware of. Your job as the parent is to become a really good researcher. There's the tool called Google Scholar, which brings you into the world of research without a medical degree, without an advanced degree in psychology. And these articles are written in whatever language you speak. And so you can you know, do some research on your own. I urge you, please avoid comparisons with other families. Most of you are on the same Facebook groups that I am. And I love them. And I think they are incredible opportunities to provide support. But I feel for parents who see and respond by comparing themselves to other families in terms of their experiences. Responses to medicine, as with all therapies, are incredibly unique. We've all gone through COVID together. There's people who got the Pfizer vaccine and had no side effects. There's people who had the Pfizer vaccine and had three days of side effects. I had no side effects. My neighbor had three days. In fact, today was day three for a second vaccine and he's only beginning to feel better. There's no accounting for that. So there are huge individual differences. I know that you are ambivalent about this conversation as well you should be. There are reasons why you would want to do it and there are reasons why you wouldn't want to do it. And that's what creates ambivalence. And it's a difficult place to be because ambivalence means you're being pulled in two directions simultaneously. A couple of years ago, I did a poll on, the, uh, on Facebook, on our uh, SMA Facebook group and 329 people responded. And I was just really interested in the results. 45% were currently using medication as part of their treatment plan of the people who responded. 9% said they would never consider using it. 4% said that that's one out of 25 said they had stopped due to side effects being greater than the benefits. 35% said they would consider it if therapy wasn't proving to be successful enough. 5% said they used it in the past and was no longer needed. And 2% said they were actively uh, starting to consider medication at the time that I did this uh, poll. So what do we know about dose ranges once you cross over and start using medicine. The 19 people in that pool of 329 who were currently on Prozac at that time had these following dose ranges from 10 milligrams to 80 milligrams, which is an eight fold difference. And you can see quite clearly the most common dose was 20. For the 15 people who were on Zoloft at that time, you can see that five were getting 25 milligrams, three were getting 50 milligrams, five were getting 75 milligrams, uh, one was getting 100 milligrams, and only one was getting more than 150 up to 200. What was striking to me about this is that the largest and longest anxiety study that I was telling you about, the CAM study, where there were the nation's experts in child psychiatry who were getting kids up to a therapeutic dose the average therapeutic dose was where that yellow line is, which means that of these 15 people, only one was getting what would have been a typical therapeutic dose in that study done by the experts in child psychiatry. And 14 out of 15 were being underdosed. So I, I caution you that if you're making the leap to medicine, work carefully with the prescribing doctor to decide is there room for improvement and not to be afraid to get up to higher doses. And they may actually need your help getting some of the research on these studies. In general, probably about 50% of people who go through getting a successful therapeutic response by combining medicine along with behavior therapy, get a successful outcome and wean off of the medicine and probably about 50% find that weaning 
is difficult and that they end up staying on doses for longer and longer periods. How does one start medications? The way to start is to find somebody that would, would prescribe for you if you were doing that and to have a consultation, simply a non-obligatory, I'm not leaving with a prescription consultation. And I know most child psychiatrists that I know do not expect that you're gonna walk out with a prescription and fill it at the local pharmacy. They expect only to have that important discussion about pros and cons. The axiom that is used by everybody who is well-trained is start low with the dose and go slow. And it's important to keep the observations coming. Um, we use rating scales and other questionnaires to help gain information that we can share with the prescribing doctors so that they can make informed decisions with you, the parents who ultimately make the decision. How do the medicines work? If you find out, please let me know because we actually don't know how they work. Conceptually, or in terms of the phenomenology of it, what we think they do, and I thank my friend, former patient, current colleague, current SMA board member, John Kohlmeyer. I thank him for this analogy that he shared with me some years ago. That he's, he would say, imagine there's a, a five foot wall. Most of you could not scale a five foot wall. But if somebody could just give you a bit of a boost, like to, you know, make it a three foot wall in effect, you would with great effort still be able to climb over. And that's for me, the best way that I describe what happens when kids with SM or other anxiety disorders get an anti-anxiety medicine. The work is still their work to do. Nobody gets a pass. You still have to guide them in their exposures. You still need to help them with an exposure lifestyle, but the task becomes doable, more doable in many cases. ACAP is the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. They have published guidelines about when to medicate children with anxiety disorders. This is not specific to selective mutism, but to anxiety disorders. They say first you consider cognitive behavior therapy, then SSRIs, which are the medicines like fluoxetine and sertraline or uh, Prozac and Zoloft as they're known, are considered the treatment of choice for child anxiety. There's no specific one medicine that's proven to be better than another for SM. And of course, you're considering per their guidelines, risk versus benefits. What's the risk of medicating? But as I said before, also what's the risk of not medicating? And again, no one SSRI is better than the other. Start low and go slow in terms of dosing. Interesting thing, when you start these medicines, parents often and typically report um, that they see, actually, I'm gonna make a different point. What, I, what I'm saying here is that if there are gonna be side effects, you're likely to see them at really low doses before you see the main effects, which is a good thing. Because if you're seeing early side effects, then you can make informed decisions about whether or not they are simply nuisance side effects, which we define as side effects that will go away on their own if you just give it a couple of weeks. Uh, so it's good to see those if they're gonna happen. But here's the other sort of, Funny thing, I, I was curious to learn this and see it myself, that often you see the main effects as early as two to three weeks, but not in the mutism, but in other ways that they're just kind of loosened up and more easygoing. If you're a parent, you should be worried or concerned or curious about whether or not it would dull their personalities, change their personalities in adverse ways. For me as a parent, that would never be an acceptable thing. But fortunately, we see often the nonspecific benefits of these medicines before we see the SM benefits per se. So we wanna make sure that kids can tolerate the medicine and then make sure that in fact, they are able to better tolerate the exposures. They will take in, if you have a consultation, they'll take into account family history. Maybe somebody responded better to one medicine or the other. Um, FDA warnings are for our protection as consumers and the famed black box warning that's in there about increases in suicidal ideation. Please note that that was not with young kids. It was not with kids with selective mutism. 
and it was not associated with any increase in suicidal behavior uh, at any age level. Um, possible side effects may include something called activation. It's kind of getting silly or sassy or cheeky, um, potentially some GI symptoms um, and other uh, potential side effects that your consultant would, would go over with you. What's likely is not to have side effects that are interfering and become a deal breaker. You can vote so, five more minutes. Very good. Uh, so we start low and go slow, uh, we meaning the people who prescribe. Um, and the idea is if there's room for improvement and the medicine is being tolerated to increase to up to a therapeutic dose, kids are typically on for a year or longer. When I said before that we consider nine-year-olds more challenging, nine and up, this is actually one study done by a guy named Steve Dummett. And he showed that there was an inverse correlation that the older kids got, the less of an improvement they saw in general. So level of improvement from zero to three, younger kids averaged about two, older kids averaged only about one. The smartest answer I ever heard to this question, I credit to Jim McCracken, he's a psychiatrist out at UCLA. How long should kids stay on medicine? And he said, after we get kids up to a therapeutic dose, he said, I'd like to keep them on through one year's life cycle of events, one return to school, one birthday party, one family gathering with the intrusive uncle who talks too loud, one Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Christmas celebration, one season with my team, one recital. Once you get through a year's life cycle of those with success, then begin thinking about weaning. It's interesting to think that kids need to relearn who they are as they change because they come to self-define that they are the kids who don't speak in school. And so it's an interesting process that they actually have to redefine who they are. Your child may be fearful about discontinuing medicine. You may be fearful about discontinuing medicine, but these are things that you can talk about. Um, it's never for the rest of their natural life as a presumption. And if you have weaned off and you have relapse, you have options to consider. Maybe getting back on medicine, maybe intensifying the behavioral treatment. You have options, your child has options. Um, when stopping the medicine, hopefully you know that um, it has to be done gradually and systematically. You wanna make sure there are no breakthrough symptoms um, and uh, kind of relapses. We want you to continue whatever you're doing behaviorally. And it's best to pick the least vulnerable time. I think return to school is a vulnerable time. Um, I think going away to sleepaway camp is a, is a vulnerable time. Um, but the idea is to watch like a hawk. All right. We have a good amount of time for Q&A. And again, lots of extra slides that I have uh, that we'll be sending to you. That was perfect timing. Um, so we had a, a few questions. Um, going back to that slide with the factors that make you lean more towards considering medication um, versus holding off on that. Um, and I think, how do you sort of differentially weigh those factors if um, kids might meet characteristics on both sides of that chart? And an example that came up a few times um, are a, a few children that are younger, five and six-year-olds, but do have severe SM symptoms and who have um, received treatment that hasn't gone very far. Um, so would you say, oh, they're still young, let's um, hold off? Or would you say, no, the severity and the lack of treatment response kind of trump that? Take the, the uh, scenario you just described. Let's say a six-year-old girl um, let's say it was not had behavior therapy yet. It would be malpractice, to st in my opinion, to start that kid out on medicine without behavior therapy or to start them with medicine and behavior therapy and not give them the benefit to just start out with behavior therapy. But if you're 23 sessions in and they're unable to talk to their teacher in their classroom, despite the fact that everybody did the right behavioral stuff, then I think it's time to add medicine to the mix. So these are relative determinations. 
And what I was referencing there was kind of like the starting point. And so that kid trudging along at 23 sessions, doing more of the same is probably not going to help. Doing more of the same with medication may be the difference in what she needs. All right, thank you. I think that was very helpful and clarifying for folks. Um, another theme that is coming up in some of the questions is around dosage. Um, when do you consider going up the dose? Um, and if you have a child who is making good progress, would you consider going up then with the idea that more medication might lead to more progress? Or would you be more likely to save that kind of increase in dosage for a kid who might be struggling and maybe needs a little bit more? Um, aside from being a clinician who sees patients every day of my, of my life, every day of my working life, um, I'm also a scientist and a researcher. So if I have a graph that's going like this, if I see change for the better, then I'm not going to make a change in that treatment plan until I see plateauing or actually getting worse. So if I have a child who's, let's say, in behavioral therapy, and the parents are guiding great exposures, and they're making progress going up here on that plus, let's say, X milligrams of whatever, right? Say 10 milligrams of Prozac, 20 milligrams. I think it makes absolutely no sense to increase the dose while they're moving up in gains. On the other hand, if they've been on 10 milligrams for three months, and the progress is starting to look like this, that means that they're plateauing and there is room for improvement. And so that's a kid who their prescribing doctor would consider increasing the dose on. But while you have progress in motion, you just, you just ride that wave. And what about when you have started medication, but you don't see progress? Um, when would you not just maybe think about increasing doses, but maybe changing medications entirely or going off medication and saying, hey, this actually isn't working for us? So I'm gonna break that down uh, to a couple of considerations. One is we're on a dose of medicine. My child is tolerating it well. They're not having significant ongoing adverse side effects and they're not getting better. That's usually an indication to try a higher dose. So when I do this webinar or this presentation live with people, I often do a show of hands and I say, how many people take uh, Advil or what an equivalent for a headache. And Rachel, when I do that, usually half the people say they take two Advil. Some people, fewer number will say they take one. A few people will admit to taking three. Nobody will admit to taking four because they're afraid to admit it. And there are a few people who take none. So if I said to you, my headache didn't go away and you found out I took half of an Advil Rachel, on behalf of the audience, what would you say to me if I said my headache didn't go away and you said, how much did you take? And I said a half an Advil. Yeah, I would probably say, well, why don't you take a, a, another Advil and see what happens? So I think that the reason I included that graph before about the survey I did online from the parents in the Facebook community, which is not a scientific survey by any means, but it demonstrates to me that 14 out of 15 were probably underdosed. So it's worth having that consideration about increasing. Now you said, what if, um, is, it, is it ever, does it ever make sense to go off the medicine? Yes, if you've maxed out the dose range on a given medicine, if you're up to 80 milligrams of Prozac, you probably should consider with your doctor switching to Zoloft. A related question is, if a child doesn't do well on one medicine, either they just don't have an effect or they have negative effects, is it possible they'll do better on the other or another SSRI? And the answer is yes. And in the literature, those are called crossover effects. So you can have kids who don't do well on one, but do well on another. And one of the things I found out along the way was that kids may not do well at age four and then do well at age six or seven. They might not do well at age six or seven and then do well on a medicine, tolerating it and benefiting from it a couple of years later. Because this thing up here is very, much in flux, it's changing. And the effect of the neurotransmitters is changing. I smile every time I think about that because I didn't know that. And once I found out about that, it, uh, it allowed some kids to then be re-referred 
for medication who I might have written off. Yeah, that's actually not something that I've really thought about that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, Steve, can you speak a little bit about um, who families should go to if they want to explore medication? Um, should they start with their pediatrician? Should they be looking for a specialist? And what if their pediatrician is not on board with medication and they kind of get that message of like, oh, you know, he's just shy, he'll grow out of it. Great, uh, great and very important question. Um, I encourage parents to have the discussion first with their pediatrician. And pediatricians, some of them have a lot of experience because of their training along the way. Uh, they have a lot of experience and they are comfortable using SSRIs and they're comfortable using, for example, stimulants for ADHD. And then a whole nother group that are just not. And they say, I'm gonna refer you to a specialist. And the specialist can range from neurologist to child psychiatrist to developmental pediatricians. Uh, so there's a range of folks who can prescribe these specialty medicines. Um, so I recommend starting with the discussion with the pediatrician. Now, the other thing you said is a, I think the expression is a straw in my cap or something. Um, it rubs me the wrong way when pediatrician well-meaning and preschool teachers well-meaning say he's just shy, whatever that means, and he'll grow out of it. What we know from experience is that while there may be some kids who have reduction in symptoms over a six month period, there's a larger group of kids who don't have a reduction in symptoms and in fact have a worsening of symptoms. And many, not many of the studies, but some of the studies we refer to use the weightless control. That means that parents agree to have their kids wait before getting treatment. And typically those kids don't get better. They either stay the same or get worse. So I'm not a big fan for the reasons I said before, because if your kid in fact has selective mutism, when they go to school tomorrow, they're gonna to have 200 more times that they practice not responding. And if it's not 200, it's 50. And every time you practice doing something the wrong way, you get better at doing it the wrong way. Um, yeah. Can you tell I, I get excited about this? Way? <laughs> I'm so yes, happy. No, it's great. Um, I'm so glad to hear you speaking about this. Um, so I have kind of two different, but sort of related questions about um, child motivation and willingness to participate in treatment. Um, and if you have a child who is very opposed to doing behavioral therapy, would you ever recommend medication um, as a, a singular treatment without um, you know, therapy at the same time? And then, um, as a, a piggyback to that, what about kids who are really opposed to taking medication? Do you have any suggestions for how parents can um, talk to them about that? So I heard at least three questions and I hope I remember them. You may have to help <laughs> Sorry, me. that was a lot. Um, first of all, when it comes to are kids motivated, I ask a question to parents in the following way to help me understand how motivated kids are. And the question I ask is, predicated on the idea that there's not a single kid I've ever met who wants to still be selectively mute. This is not a fun thing to have or go through. So here's the question I ask. Rachel, I'm gonna pretend you're the parent because you're the, the only one I see here, right? So you'll do a little role play with me. So I say this, I'm gonna ask you a question. If the answer is no, it doesn't mean anything. If the answer is yes, that's a great thing. And here's the question. Has your child ever shown in any way, shape or form that they're motivated for treatment, that they said, I don't like this. I wish it was different. I wish I could talk. Did they ever hit themselves over it? If the answer is yes to that, that means they're obviously motivated. But if the mm -hmm. answer is no, it doesn't mean they're not motivated to me. It only means that they don't believe help is on the way. So I think we need to be careful when we ascribe to kids that they're either motivated for treatment or not. Now, if they, I think one variation on the theme you said is what if kids are not motivated to do the behavioral treatment, would we ever do medicine as the treatment instead of the behavioral treatment? I've never been in that position, but I'll tell you that Dr. Dummett is the only uh, expert psychopharmacologist I know who would treat kids with medicine alone and not with therapy as well. So I think I bring a philosophical bias to that and I've never actually been in that position. Now for kids who parents say they won't take the medicine, there, I think we need to do some education and parent training to help them help their kids 
take the medicine. I think often, and I don't mean this in a way that challenges how much parents are trying to convince their kids, but their own ambivalence about it often comes across and can be kind of a signal to kids that if they put up really a big fuss about it, they won't do it. I don't believe in tricking kids. I believe in transparency. So I think when we have kids where the family is ready to do medicine and the kids are not, we just need to take our time and do the work with the kids to help them uh, be able to cross over to that. But if a kid, God forbid, has diabetes, they don't have a choice not to take insulin. If they have, God forbid, any other condition, uh, it's the parent's responsibility to have them get the treatment that the parent believes is correct. But never a power struggle and never forcing a kid. Uh, but, and I also don't believe in tricking them. I know we have only a couple of minutes left. Yeah, we have about five minutes. I'll try to get one or two more questions in there. Um, and you know, I know we won't get to everyone, um, but I wonder if you could share any thoughts that you have about um, kind of alternative um, treatments like herbal um, treatments and dietary-based interventions and how they may complement using medication or if there's any evidence that they're effective instead of sort of our traditional um, like SSRIs that we yeah. commonly it, prescribe. Certainly a very important question. Um, I do have a bias and my bias is that I look to science to help me make informed opinions to share with my families. So if I can't look to a well-controlled study that was published in a peer reviewed journal, I'm gonna be skeptical. Um, and I think it's important as consumers for parents to remember that just because something is marketed as natural and it's in a health food store or they can buy it online without a prescription, it doesn't necessarily mean it's safe, nor does it necessarily mean it's effective just because somebody wrote on the label that it's effective. So I'm biased. I look to peer reviewed published articles to help me make that determination. Has it ever steered me wrong? Probably. For example, St. John's wort is used in Europe commonly to treat depression, and yet there's an American bias against it, but it doesn't mean that it's not effective. I think parents need to weigh what do we know about the thing that they're talking about taking, and then how would we measure its outcome? Um, and that's where blinded studies are helpful because the person looking to see the behavior change doesn't know whether the child got something or didn't get something. So I would urge, urge, urge caution. Yeah. And Steve, as a maybe last question, can you talk a little bit about the weaning process? You know, you described that sort of year of um, being on medication, but um, when it's time to wean, how slowly do you um, suggest people do that? And um, do you ever see cases where maybe the SM symptoms continue to kind of show progress, but other anxieties pop up? The short answer is you see every variation on the theme. The slightly longer answer is that pretty much as slowly as you ramped up the dose is probably gonna mirror about how slowly you ramp down from the dose. And the idea, is to make a change and then observe, make a change and then observe. And most people would wait at least several weeks, if not more than several weeks, to observe any change in behavior as the medicine is coming down and then continue to wean off. One common scenario is weaning off completely. And then when other new developmental challenges come into play, like changing to high school, going away to college, uh, somebody may choose then to bring medicine back on board. What I'll tell you from clinical experience, not from research, is that once parents have crossed over and had a successful experience with medicine, they're much less concerned about weaning off of it and much more readily able to uh, follow their child as they become young adults to them going back on medicine on an as needed basis. Again, probably half of kids are able to wean off successfully and probably another half need to stay on longer periods of uh, being medicated. My hope for this presentation is that parents feel empowered to ask the questions that they feel less afraid of the option um, and feel no more obligated to get their kid medicated or not. 
uh, because it's a very, very personal and obviously difficult decision. Well, Steve, that brings us to 801. You've got some unanswered questions here, um, but as we said at the beginning of the presentation, um, we will um, figure out a, a time for Dr. Kurtz to um, come live again and continue this conversation. And we know that you know, some of these questions are, are really nuanced um, and they, they've all been incredibly thoughtful. Um, so we appreciate everyone um, kind of chiming in and, uh, um, and asking. And our thanks again to the Macklin Foundation. Yes, and thank you to you for presenting. My pleasure.